Hello, my name is Denise Luneman, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. I'm excited to share this Sunday message with you. Would you take a moment right now to subscribe to our channel? And if you like this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up so that we know you've been blessed. You can do those things below. I don't know if you've ever played around on the internet, but uh, the internet is full of stories of dumb criminals. If you ever really just want to have a good time, now I was doing it for sermon preparation, okay? Sermon preparation. But if you ever wanted to have a good time, just Google dumb criminals and see what comes up and see all the different things that happen to appear there and all the different things that just show up. There are YouTube videos and there's everything else. And I was looking for the perfect story because there's something that I've noticed. And that is that if I start off with something kind of funny, you guys will pay attention. But if I start off with something kind of serious, you're already asleep before I get to the good stuff. <laughs> so I didn't come up with one that I really, really just said, this is the one that's worth sharing. Uh, but what about the bank robber who hands over his ID? The story goes something like this. He goes in there with his note and he says, hey, give me all your money. And the teller says, well, I can't dispense money without an ID. And so he handed it over. I told you I was Googling dumb criminals, didn't I? Uh, how about the one that he was so excited to get the money, he handed his gun to the teller? That will kind of mess you up as well. Or how about these mastermind criminals? I mean, come on now. They really, really planned ahead. And they called the bank and said, we're on our way. We're about to rob the bank. Can you get the money ready for us? <laughs> Let it sink in for a minute. There was money, but there was also... <laughs> and there were lots of other stories I read. Uh, there's a lot that have uh, the, the cameras, now that we have cameras everywhere, right? Of people who are trying to hide their face. And one of my favorites was a guy that, I don't know, we didn't look like he was in the U.S., but he had this, like, wicker basket in front of his face, and he's walking like this towards the camera. And he keeps going like this. And I think his intent was to move the camera so it couldn't see him. But he wasn't quite sure if he was up to the camera yet. So he kept going like this. <laughs> Another one was trying to make sure that he wouldn't be seen. So he put a bag, a plastic bag, over his head. Oh, no. <laughs> Did I mention that the bag was clear? <laughs> It was a clear plastic, plastic bag. As I went through these stories, I started to think that each one seems to show a lack of thoughtful planning. One of them that, is one of my problems, to be quite honest with you, is I start reading this story and then I feel really bad for whoever the dumb criminal is. And in one of them, he was trying to get the gate like, to lift up so that it would be loose and he could open the gate. And he succeeded in doing that. However, this big iron gate then fell on him. And he hobbles away because his leg is now broken and his foot is just dangling there. And so it's like, oh, let me tell you about this wonderful story. Get this sermon started off fast. But then I'm like, oh, the poor guy. It's like, how do you explain that? You know, anyway. But, but I thought through, you know, we are you used to the movies, right? And in the movies, whenever there's going to be a bank robbery, there has to be a group of friends who are about to do the heist. Amen? Amen. So you get the group together and they've got this perfect plan and they've got somebody to do it. I actually, when I was doing all of my research, I, one of the things I wondered about is are there statistics available for how long in advance somebody plans a crime out? And oddly enough, there are no statistics on how far in advance. There is a, a Time Magazine article from about 2012 that talks about the best way to rob a bank. And by the way, it talks about you should have more than one person because your chances of increasing the amount of money you'll bring in increase the more people you have. 
And so they talk about some things and, you know, you need people for the getaway car and all of this if you want to do it successfully. But they also said that about 25% of bank robbers get caught. So you have a, a, if you should happen to feel like you got away with it, you should stop because each time you still have a one in four chance. So by the time you get to your fourth bank robbery, you're probably going to get caught. And they said that bank robberies are down. Why? Because time's best advice is don't do it. <laughs> anyway, we got to wonder when people are planning these out and they just haven't really thought it through, like don't take your ID with you. And then you won't accidentally hand it over and then go, oh, that was dumb. <laughs> you know, the, we, we think, are they really serious? There was one where the bank robber gets caught right outside the bank because he decided to stop and count the money. How serious was he? Just go. Figure it out later. As we've been sort of looking through some things that, that the, the Lord has told us, that he puts in his word, that, that he speaks out of his mouth, that we sometimes go, you know what? I wonder how serious we need to take that. I wonder how important this really is. I wonder if this is something that, that really we need to, to pay close attention to. We've talked a little bit about some issues already, but where is our foundation? Jesus tells us our foundation needs to be on the rock, not on shifting sand. But do we really take that seriously? Do, do we really follow along with that? Do we work towards just looking at God in trust and peace instead of being anxious? You remember that verse, right? But in everything... Thank you. I'll give you a kiss later. <laughs> Do we properly consider the cost before following Jesus? He says something, and, I, and it sounds like it'd be really easy, right? Just, just pick up your cross and follow me. Great. We like to wear a cross around our neck, right? Piece of jewelry. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. This morning, my question for us is this. How can we ensure that we do not steal from God? Oh, I know. It was all fun and games until that moment, huh? Oh, that was... Oh, all right. You know, stealing from God... Hmm. Malachi chapter 3. It's a favorite passage to talk about tithing. And, and there's a couple things I want you to get. If at the end of this sermon, the only thing that you've heard is that I want you to give more money to the church, you were not listening. I will sentence you to go back and watch the YouTube video two or three times until you get it. Because I'm going to talk about Malachi chapter 3, and I'm going to talk a little bit about giving to the church. But my point isn't that you should be giving your tithe. Although, if God is talking to you about that, you had better do it. Amen. Second thing is, I've always said the worst thing to ever do is talk about tithing when you are either really down as a church and you really need more money. To even bring up tithing seems like it's sort of self-serving. It's like, hey, we're really broke, and can you like, actually do what the Bible says and give? And we are not in that place as a congregation. Our goal is $12,500 roughly, and, and we don't absolutely have to have that amount. I will tell you that last month, which was the first month of summer, that we brought in twelve one, twelve two. We were two or three hundred dollars short, but it also was a three pay period month, and it was also the insurance payment was due month, and everything else, and and we still covered all the expenses. So, pop quiz: What is this sermon going to be about, or what is this sermon going to be not about? Okay. Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6 through 10. Are you ready? Because here we go. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees, and have you, you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. 
But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, and says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So God goes from, hey, check this out, you're robbing me, to, hey, if you will just do what I'm telling you to do, you wouldn't be able to handle everything I could throw at you. And I want to warn you a little bit. As much as I said that this isn't about tithing, I don't think he's talking about money. I don't think he's talking about money. Malachi's message here is to the people of the covenant. He's talking specifically to the people of Israel in a time where, where they have just kind of gone off and they're doing their own thing again. They're off and trying to do their own sort of thing and trying to make sure that, that they are happy the way they want to be happy. And so Malachi comes in and he brings this message from God that sort of comes in this unique dialogue sort of thing. So you have God saying to begin with this whole little bit that I am God, I do not change. And so because of that, you still exist, but you're robbing me. And then you have the people saying, what? We're smarter than that. And God says, uh, actually, you're not. You're not doing everything that I've asked you to do. And there's a lot more to it. That's one of the problems that he really gets. It seems like when you first read Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 10, that robbing God is all about money. But is it really all about money? And to really get to that answer, we'd have to go back to the beginning of the book. And I would love to read it right now and preach through the whole thing. But you guys told me that you want to go to lunch. I'll give you a, a quick sort of thing. And, and this goes back to Malachi 1. You can go read it later. Don't read it now. I'm preaching. But you can go read it later if you really want. But the Lord speaks of four ways that Israel was robbing him throughout the book of Malachi. Are you ready? The first one is a failure to worship properly. Go all the way back to the first part of the book, verse 6. You're six verses in. And really, the accusation that God is making against the Israelites is that they have totally misunderstood what worship is all about, and they've totally not followed the directions. The directions said, bring the best to me. Bring the very best, the first, the most wonderful, the thing that you normally wouldn't want to give away, but you'd want to keep for yourself. You bring that part to me. That's the instructions. Uh, however, they were offering blind, diseased, lame animals for sacrifices. It would be kind of like if you went to, hey, you know what, somebody's birthday is coming up, and I'm going to go find something that I, I have in my house that I'm going to give them. And instead of going and finding your most prized possession and saying, you, you are so important to me, I'm giving you the thing that matters most. But you go and you find something either that you have a whole bunch of, or that it's broken. Gee, thanks, right? Here's this broken thing. Here, here's, this, here's this thing. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't get any money for it down at the market, so I'll bring it to God. Sort of like the people that called the butterball turkey line at Thanksgiving time and said, my turkey's been in my refrigerator for 10 years. Is it still edible? And they said, well, you, technically it should still be editable, but it would not taste very good. And the lady on the phone said, great, I'll give it to the church. <laughs> and the, the reality is we have to bring the very best to God. And this is what the Israelites were not doing. Secondly, they were robbing God because there was a failure of priests to honor him. And now you may be saying to me, okay, that's on you, Pastor. But I want you to stop and think about it. There's a, a group of people in this room. We call you a congregation. 
And as a congregation, I'm only as good as you guys will listen and whatever. And sometimes, if you feel like you need to challenge me, you ought to be doing so. Amen. Works both ways, right? I challenge you, you can challenge me. If you think I'm off in another world, let's talk about it and I'll show you how you're wrong. It's not a big deal. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would love to journey with you and we could see if I'm wrong or you're wrong. And that's the truth. I, I <sighs> God makes a little bit of a, a threat in chapter two. And he says, look, you guys have chosen not to honor me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to smear dung on your faces. You guys, it's in the Bible. You act like I'm making this up. It's what he says, and, and the, the translators love to really tear through this verse, and well, is it throwing dung at their faces, or is it actually smearing? What difference does it make? Do you get the point? It's a very humiliating, you are not doing well kind of moment. And God is saying, look, this is what's going to happen. And here's the problem. The priests are complicit in a lazy sort of worship. You know, the priests ought to be the ones who, when you bring this broken animal, go, this was the best you could do? Really? This was the best you would bring the God who created you? The God who provides? This is it? The priest has a job, and the job is to say, go home. Try again. This is not what God asked you for. And so that's kind of rough. But the reality is that God says that the priests have not resolved to honor him. That's a bit of a challenge. Number three, we robbed God, the Israelites robbed God by a failure to honor others. The way we treat each other matters. I want to make sure we get that clear. The way we act, when I, it's really a lot cooler on this side than it is over there. <laughs> we should check an air conditioner. Anyway, um, it's a failure to, to honor others. And, and when we are not careful, we have an issue. We have a problem. We have a, 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 an issue. And one of the problems is, is that in this particular case, there's this intermarriage that defiles the temple, which also defiles the community. When I say honoring others, sometimes we think, oh, what I do is my decision and it only affects me. We don't think about the fact that whatever decision I make affects everybody around me. And so you begin to start to look and you start to see that, that there becomes this issue of when we defile the temple, we defile the entire community. And then we get God angry with us. For lack of a better way to say it. There was also an incredible amount of un adultery and unfaithfulness to spouses. So God is looking and he's saying, here's some things that you've done that, that haven't been what you were supposed to be doing. Number four, they had a failure to maintain purity. This comes just before he says, oh, by the way, this whole thing about tithing and you've been robbing me. So when we begin to look and we begin to see this idea that there's a failure to maintain purity, there's a failure for us to do what we're supposed to do. They did things like tolerated sorcery, adultery, economic exploitation, which means that the poor become poorer and the rich become richer, and they just stood around and went, okay, that's fine. It's fair. Whatever you want to charge in interest is fine with us because, you know, people should have to pay it. I think we have to be careful about this, right? Because the, the idea is that this tolerating everything else, sometimes what happens when we tolerate everything else is we leave no room for God and for what God has called us to do. I'm curious, were the, the Israelites what we would call a practical atheist? If you've never heard that term before, a practical atheist doesn't necessarily say that there is no God. They may say that there, in fact, is a God, but then they turn around and live as though God doesn't exist or that God has no authority over their lives. 
This is a challenge for us in the church today, even still. I think that's one of the problems. Malachi's message is repentance, not finance. What God says in that is, hey, pay me off and you'll have a good life. Just pay me off. He doesn't say that. He says, come back to me and I will come back to you. You'll see my blessings again. You'll see all of the wonderful things that I've given you again. Wouldn't that be awesome? You guys sound somewhat convinced. <laughs> see, the, the thing is, the, the people are prone to wander. God doesn't wander off. We do. God isn't sitting there going, gee, well, if you tithe to me, I don't know if I can handle giving you any more money to take care of your bills. God isn't the one saying, look, if you give me some of your time, you're not going to be able to watch your favorite TV show this week. He, he doesn't do any of that. He, he just says, look, here, you have this problem. The problem is, is that you're robbing me. He tells them, you're robbing me in these four ways, and let me give you a specific, you are robbing me with your tithe. And here's the solution. Repent. Turn from your sin. Come back to me. It's good news. And the problem is, is that what does repentance mean, right? What does it really mean to repent? When you get to this call to repent, what, what God is saying is, stop worrying about yourself. That's the problem that separates us from God. If you've never figured it out yet, let me tell you, this is worth the price of admission today. If not, I'll refund your ticket price on the way out the door. The problem is, God is God, and we wish we were. It's the fundamental problem. And so sometimes we look at God and we say, hey, we really want to be you, and so we're going to take a little bit of your role because we know what's best for us, not you. God says, turn away from that. That's not getting you anywhere. That's not what's going to do. Robbing God is less about money, and it's more about taking him seriously. I almost see God as sort of saying, you're robbing me, so that the, the people of Israel will go, what? And God's saying, now that I have your attention, now that you're actually listening, would you just do the things that I've asked you to do? And then they go, oh, that's what it's all about? That's what you want? The tithe, really, when it comes down to it, it's just a symptom of a much larger problem. Look, if you are sitting here today and you're going, oh, he's talking about tithing and uh, la, 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 la. Uh, one of the problems is, is not that it's about the money because it's, it's not about the money. We think it's about the money. But it's not. Now, take that one issue and put it into every issue in your life. Having a problem with somebody at work? Got a neighbor that's a little cranky? Are you the neighbor that's a little cranky? <laughs> the, the reality is, is that we can take every one of these and can you trust God to handle all of those situations? And if not, you're robbing what God wants to do in your life. Think about that for just a little bit. One of the greatest issues that we see in the book of Malachi is that what the Israelites want is for God to keep blessing them over and over and over and over and over again. They want the benefit of the blessings, but they don't want to have to uphold their side of the bargain. That God made a covenant with the Israel nation, right? You will be my people. And they want to get the blessings of being God's people without having to do the work of being God's people. Thankfully, we're not like this at all today. Right? Don't you hate when your clicker doesn't click? Now it's going to go watch. Oh. 
is there a reason to believe that Malachi's message from God is still an issue today? When you, when you look around at the church today, when you look around at tithing, is there a reason to believe that this is still an issue today? I, I would guess so. I, I'm not just talking about money. Everybody talks. If, you know, if everybody in the church, not in this church, but in the church tithed, we wouldn't know what to do with all of the money. Want an example of that? Look at the Mormon church. You have to tithe in the Mormon church. They ask for your pay stubs to prove you're doing it. When was the last time the Mormon church said, we have an air conditioner out? We've got to have a few fundraisers and a barbecue to, to raise money. They just say, hey, the air conditioner's out. I've got uh, four ideas of why I think the church appears to struggle or where I think the church appears to struggle today. Four areas that I think that we are not always good at and that we need to be careful about and that um, we, in, in a sense, rob God from. The first one is this. I think that sometimes today that the church has a failure to worship properly. Failure to worship properly. And now here's the problem with, with what, I, what I'm trying to say to you. When I say those words, I know that some of you right away are going, oh, he wants me to raise my hand or more amens in the sermon. Amen? Amen. He wants to stand. He wants us to stand the whole time. He, he wants us to cheer for the offering. Yay. Oh, we didn't sing my favorite song this morning. And you know, the person next to me was singing a little off key. And somebody said the wrong words when we were singing and started too early or started too late. I'm sure all of that happened this morning, right? <laughs> but let me explain something to you. If that was your experience in worship this morning, you missed worship. Amen. You missed it. Hey, worship isn't a Sunday morning activity. Or maybe I should say worship isn't just a Sunday morning activity. Amen. This is the moment when we get together, when we gather, and we, we get to have a little taste of heaven, mm -hmm. where we come in and we worship God, and for our three and a half hours after the sermon is over, We concentrate on God and God's word, and that's it. But that's not really worship. Worship is truly a way of life. You see, I'm not talking about every time you walk around, you just sing in a hymn. I used to, I worked with a pastor that sometimes he'd walk into the office and he'd just be singing a hymn. I'm like, where'd that come from? Walking into the office, just singing a hymn. Unfortunately, now sometimes I walk into my office and hum a hymn. <laughs> Go right to Alexa and say, hey, play this because I need to hear it. Right away. Hey, worship is a way of life. Hey, you want to know how you're doing a good job of worshiping? Other people see it. And I'm not talking about they see every time you turn around, you're singing a hymn. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that they see God in you. If we are to be created in God's image. True worship is for us to reflect God's image. That's a whole other sermon, though. I don't have time for that. We are so busy worshiping something else most of the time. One of the problems I have, I was lamenting the decline of numbers in the church, and one of the problems is, is that we have this influx of children's activities that are happening on Sunday morning. 
particularly in bigger cities, school sports, recitals. They're moving a lot of that stuff to Sunday morning because church just isn't important to people anymore. And so I also noticed that sometimes I talk to people and, and you invite them to church and they give you this weird answer and they say, Sunday is the only day I have to sleep in. How much are you sleeping in on Sunday? 10.30 is not early. <laughs> Most people are not coming from 100 miles away. If you're coming from 5, 10 minutes away, you could sleep till 10 and still make it. Come in your pajamas. I don't care. Just be dressed. <laughs> Bring your coffee into the sanctuary. It's more important that you're here. I'm not talking, you guys are here, so I don't really have to preach to you about that, but, but that's what I want to tell everybody that tells me those kind of excuses. Sometimes we're so busy running kids here and there, and, and I got enough of them that I can test to this. And we have to make some hard decisions sometimes of whether or not they can do something because of, uh, you know, we could go crazy. I could probably hire a full-time person just to drive kids around if I let them do everything they wanted to do. The only day to sleep in. Second, I think there's a failure in the church today of ministers who choose to honor God. I'm a little upset about this one, to be honest. But I think it's all the same things from back in Israel where there becomes this issue of there's expectations of pastors in the church like to be a CEO and to be entertaining and to, you know, every single Sunday, you guys want me to hit a home run up here. I know. And by the way, every single Sunday I want to. I want to take a swing at it and hit it out of the ballpark and have you all walk out going, yes, God spoke to me today. Amen. It's really what I'd like. It's, however, there are some days not so good. Amen. I can bore you to death just as good as anyone else. <laughs> and I've done it. But the reality is that, that we have to be able to, to talk to one another. That instead of it all being just about me, that it would be about God. And by the way, in, in a certain sense, you're all ministers. But the second thing is, is that it's super easy for a pastor to become sort of complicit in this lazy worship idea. And in part, because if I come to you and say, hey, listen, I love that you come to church once every six weeks. How do you keep in touch with God the other five? Where are you spending your time with God when you're not here? Because once every six weeks, you've got to get to know God again before you can even get started. Unless you're doing something in the six weeks. There's a time when we have to be able to speak to one another and be able to say, hey, look, I noticed this. This might be going on in your life. And I'm concerned about it. But sometimes pastors have this idea that if we do that, you might get mad and leave the church as though that's the most important thing. It's also easy, way too easy, to become distracted in doing good things. I've got to be careful about that. I just go there. Third, there's a failure to honor others. Any of these sounding familiar to you guys? I'm making you write it down twice if you're taking notes. <coughs> Marriage has become less of a sacrament and more of a legal contract. All the statistics are showing that today's kids don't even understand why you should bother. Just live together. That way if things don't work out, you don't have the mess of a divorce. Okay. You're still in a mess. Um, and are we as a church really doing everything we should be to convince people otherwise? Uh, adultery or infidelity remains at steady rates. I don't know what the stats were back in, in the time of Malachi, but I know that recently they haven't changed. 
I think one of the interesting things is, is that whether the study is done in the church or the study is done in the world, the results are the same. I thought it was kind of interesting that when you get to this particular point, that there are some people who say that, the, that it's anywhere from 25 up to 50% of married people or dating committed people fool around. And they argue whether it's between 25 and 50. Right now they say that pornography affects 60 to 68% of men in the church which is also the exact same as in the world, up to 30% of women. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? You see why I say sometimes pastors might be complicit in this lazy worship because instead of talking about things like that, because it's really uncomfortable. Because if that statistic is true, I'm looking at some of you. How often do we consider others first? That's scriptural, isn't it? You remember? Treat others as you want to be treated. Consider others more important than yourselves. It's not all about you. It's not a message we like to hear, but it's one that we hear in the Bible. I'm not sure we're doing the best at honoring others, and, and sometimes it does bring our community down. Sometimes it does stain it. Number four, we have a failure to maintain purity. Now, I could go on and on and on about this. I'm, I'm not going to take the time, but I do want to tell you that I think that our society is one of the most tolerant of all, going back through lots of recent memory years, except when it comes to God. We got to be tolerant of this and tolerant of that and tolerant of this and tolerant of that. But if you ask somebody to be tolerant of the fact that you believe in God and they're like, really? The problem is, is that we tend to want to fit in with that society. That in order to gain acceptance, we'll be little closet Christians. Because God wants more for us than that. And if we were to say what God would be putting the words into our mouth to say in a room full of people that is telling us we must be tolerant, we would be the outsider. Except here's the thing. God has called us to be outsiders. He's called us to live separately from the culture. It's another sermon. I'll preach it another day. I've come convinced more and more that there are practical atheists in the church. More and more convinced. Oh, yeah. They've been saved, they've been baptized, they might even tithe. But they live the most of their life as though God doesn't exist or have any influence over them. To seriously repent is to take a risk that the, that the life that God wants for you to have is the best life. I want to make sure that I'm clear on this. When you take this idea of repenting seriously, when, when we look and we see ourselves in some of these things and, and we say, you know what, I may not have been doing the very best that I could be in this particular area, to seriously say, Lord, I want to turn from that and head closer to you. I will return to you and see you return to me. And that is truly a risk we are taking. Why? Because we are usually very comfortable where we are. It's wonderful to be able to live with one foot in the world and one foot out of the world and be able to sort of check in on Sunday and then punch the time card on the way back out. You're off duty now. You've done your God for the week. I know none of you do that, but it's easy and it's comfortable. And to be able to recognize that in our own lives and then be able to turn around and say, Lord, I don't want to live my life that way is a risk 
Because it exchanges our comfort. And by the way, if you really live the way God wants you to live, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable a lot of the time. He's going to ask you to do some things that you're going to be like, excuse me? What did you just say? You want me to give what? Do what? Talk to who? Hmm. But God has this idea of how your life could be. And it's so much better than anything that's comfortable. Anyway, you don't believe me, so I'll keep going. <laughs> Money is an example. <clears throat> Tithing begins as a risk of giving. I haven't met all of you and had enough of a conversation with you to know if each and every person in here is independently financially wealthy and you have all the money that you think you will ever need. If that is your case, please come talk to me after service. I'd like to speak. But the reality is, is that most of us are concerned about something here or something there. And a lot of people, the statistics are alarming of how many people are just living paycheck to paycheck and couldn't even handle something simple. So when we say you should give some money to the church, well, 10%? Really? Do you know what I could do with 10% of my paycheck? You see, we want control. And God says, hey, give up that control for a minute. See what will happen if you trust me. Now, here's the thing. I told you, this is not about money. It's an example. And now, let's take that same exact idea and go through worship. What would happen if we tried to truly live our lives worshiping God, reflecting his image to everyone around us? The problem is we want control. How about honoring God when we want to be honored? Which is truly the problem of the priests and the pastors, right? How about honoring others? Again, we want to be honored. We want uh, people to take our advice, not us to have to take someone else's. Because we know what's best for us and everyone else. You know that, right? What if we decide that rules that God has shouldn't really be because, you know what, they're, they're outdated and old? It works with every one of these. The, the, the basic principle is still true. God's view is withholding the tithe is robbing me. Not doing what I've called you to do is robbing me. Not doing what I expect you to do is robbing me, but I think one of the things that God's trying to tell us is that it's also robbing ourselves. I think that's part of it. Convinced that no one ever sets out and says, you know what? I have an idea. I have the most brilliant plan ever. I am going to rob from God. I'm not talking churches sometimes get stolen from. People break into churches or embezzle money or whatever. But I don't think anyone sets out. You know, I don't think anybody wakes up this morning and goes, you know what, I think what I'll do today, I'm going to run a heist on God. See what happens. If that is you, again, talk to me after service. We need to have a discussion. But I think sometimes we've accidentally stolen from God because we weren't aware and that's kind of where we get back to our question. How can we ensure that we do not steal from God? How do we come back to that? How, how do we get there? And here's my first answer for us. To ensure that we don't steal from God, we must first repent from our theft. Right? Did, did I get those words right? Yes, those are the correct words. The, the, rea the reality is, is that we have all stolen from God. Even before we came to him, we were stealing from him. Especially when you consider it not to be just money. When you begin to, begin to look at that, we must first begin to go, all of the times when we choose not to honor God, but to honor ourselves, all of the times when we choose to keep control over a situation, every one of those, we must now repent of. 
and say, we don't want to do this anymore. We want to go the other way. And by the way, this means that you're going to have to sit down and really look through. And is there anything in your life, anything about the state of your faith that you are stealing or that you are robbing God? I wonder if there's any areas that you are stealing from God through inaction. Things that he's called you to do or, or told you to do and you're just not doing. Anything like that. Think about it. God said it to Israel back in Malachi. He says it to us constant, continually. He sends his son so that we can have this sort of relationship. And he says simply this, come to me and I will return to you. So the first thing is, we need to repent and return to what God wants us to do. It's what we ought to be doing from the beginning. Second thing, to ensure that we do not steal from God, we must plan to be faithful. What? All right, I'm here in church, Pastor. What are you talking about? 10.30 on Sunday morning, I'm here. It's not what I'm talking about. If we aren't doing our very best to make sure that we know what we're going to do in any situation where God is, is maybe going to, to be standing around seeing how we react, we will miss it. I don't know what you are tempted by. I could get really serious here, but I'm going to go for a little less serious and tell you that I am often tempted by chocolate donuts. If I do not want to eat a lot of chocolate donuts, which will then result in me needing to be in the gym more frequently and my doctor to be yelling at me more often, I need to have a plan. I happen to know where Dunkin' Donuts is. I don't go there. I don't go buy a dozen so I can have them in the house. Got to have a plan. Got to stick to the plan. Now, do you do that with your faith? What tempts you to, to, to kind of walk away from God, to, to sort of reach in there and take control out? What's your plan for dealing with that? Take these four things, plus tithing, and you, what's your plan to remain faithful? What are you going to do? What are you making happen? Think about this. Love starts as an emotion. You fall in love. Oh, oh googly eyes. The emotion begins to fade. If we only knew love as an emotion and, and that was it, you got to have a plan. What happens when the love starts to fade away? You don't have a plan. You're going to part ways with whoever you love. Got to have a plan. The emotion is going to go away. It's going to happen. So what do married couples do? They fight. So they can make up, right? I'm just teasing. Date nights, movie nights, send the kids to bed early nights. All the good stuff, right? Volunteering, it's exciting at first. Woohoo! Till you realize it's work. What's your plan for when the novelty is gone? Just quit? God, I think you called me to this, but you know what? It's gotten really bothersome. Got to have a plan. And giving means letting control of our money go over to God. This is easy to do. You've got to have a plan. What's the plan to make it happen? There's four areas that we've been talking about. That's the first four areas I think we ought to be looking at in our own lives. What should we be doing? What should we be making sure that we have a plan for? 
How are you doing when it comes to worship, honor of God, honor of others, and purity of faith? Got a plan? Got a way to make it happen? To endure, ensure that we do not steal from God, we must learn to test Him. Oh, wait, hold on, Pastor. Don't think God wants to be tested. Were you paying any attention? Because he said, test me and see what will happen. And I'm telling you that he says that about all these things. Test me. See what will happen. Verse 10, by the way, it's not a promise of wealth. It's a promise that we will live a full life right in the center of God's will. So test him and see what happens when you're right where God wants you to be. It's not a promise that God's going to ensure that we don't have any problems. If you can find that in the Bible, let me know. I have some people that I want to talk to about that. But normally God says things like this, I'm going to be with you in your times of trial. Or hey, guess what? You're always going to have trials. Woohoo! But to test God is to trust God. I know last week Jeannie mentioned that you had to trust. She used the idea of the chair, right? You trusted the chair to hold you up. How's it doing so far? Well, no worries. I only loosened a few screws. Might not have been in, might have been in the troublemaker row. I'm not really sure. Some of you are like, uh, let's check these screws. I didn't have time for that, all right? <laughs> but you trust that the chair is going to work. When, when you did that, you tested it. And I, I know this of anybody who's over the age of 18 for sure, probably even those that are under the age of 18, that there have been times when you've looked at a chair and went, I'm not sure that chair is going to hold me. And you walk up to it, and you kind of check it out. And then you kind of really gently ease into the chair. You're testing it to see if it can be trusted. And at least once or twice, I have misplaced my trust in a chair. But the reality is, is that when we begin to look at God and begin to test Him, all we got to do is trust Him. In tithing, you, you test God by trusting that He's going to meet all your needs. You give the money he tells you to give, and you see if he meets your needs. Not that if he's going to replace it, not if he's going to do whatever else, but did you miss the money? It's amazing how often when you are faithful to God, you didn't even miss it. One of our problems, I'm convinced of this, is that we tend to plan for when God is going to fail. Which is stupid. Because God doesn't fail us. Amen. So if you're going to test God, truly test Him. Let Him prove Himself right. He will. Have you been testing or trusting God with everything in your life lately? Of course, right? Everything. Are you willing to try? I hope so. It seems that sometimes we're the dumbest criminals around. Because you have a God who says, look, don't rob from me. And we're like, oh, I think I can get away with it. I can still do what God wants, but not. We're the ones that are kind of going, God, don't look. Going to do something I know you don't like right now. And he's up there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back and apologize later. We steal from God sometimes, and we like to pretend like we get away with it. My kids are the same way. We're God's kids. I guess he can be as loving as I am to my kids, probably more. But why? Why not just do what God is asking? Why not just trust him? Why, why not just make sure that we're not robbing both his opportunity to bless us and our opportunity to obey Him. 
God doesn't get fooled. He knows what you've done. It's, it's easy. He, he always calls you back. It's the greatest thing about God. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how bad it is, he says, return to me and I'll return to you. Where do you place your trust this morning? I want you to be honest. It's real easy to be sitting in church and go, the answer to this question is God. Or Jesus. Jesus is always a good answer. Here's my problem. We're sitting here in church going, oh yeah, of course it's God. All right. Now, we're going to pray. Amen. And while I'm praying, I'm going to ask God to tell you if your answer to this question is correct. Because my opinion doesn't matter about what I think, where I put my trust. It's His. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Even when it's difficult sometimes, Lord, because we want to be in control. Whether it be of our money or of our pride or whatever it may be. We want to say that we trust you. Lord, I don't think that there's too many people in this room who when I said, well, this is the question we've got to ask ourselves, their first thought was, well, it's me, of course. Or I put my trust in my money, or I put my trust in my position, or I put my trust in whatever else. But Lord, <laughs> I would hope that all of our answers this morning could truly be that we put our trust in you. That you are the center, that you are the one but if it's not, speak to us now. Point out those areas where we do not trust you and we should. That we may truly take this seriously and not be a robber of God, but to truly just put all of our faith, all of our hope, all of our love, all of our trust in you. Be with us as we leave this morning. Keep us safe until we have the opportunity to worship together once again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon with me. If you enjoyed your time with us, we'd invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.